welcome to the video. My name is Finn and today I'll be combining two of my favourite things in the whole wide world, history and food. Today I'm going to be making a dish with many names, uh, pasta in marinara, pasta pomodoro, pasta in red sauce, pasta in tomato sauce. You know what I'm making, it's a staple of Italian food, but today I'm going to maybe show us why uh, a dish that can be synonymous with the cuisine of a certain country can have origins all over the globe, stretching as far as the Americas to Eastern Asia, but still, this is going to be really tasty. Let's give it a go. So the exact recipe I'm going to make today is an arecchietti al pomodoro, and I'm going to use a combination of recipes, one coming from the streets of Italy a few hundred years ago, and another uh, more recent one from Italian Americans living in New York today. So we've got quite a few different ingredients to get through and we're going to talk about the history of them and how not many of them at all originate in modern Italy. So let's get started and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take three cloves of garlic and half an onion and we're going to dice those up as small as we can. Now do forgive my poor knife work in the following clips, but uh, you know, um, as long as you end up with very small pieces of each, that will do just nicely. Now both of these ingredients are of course synonymous with Italian cooking these days, uh, garlic in almost all Italian dishes, and similarly with onion, you know, an, an absolute staple, especially of uh, pasta sauces. And there's a lot of good reasons for that, uh, which we may come into soon. But it's remarkable to think that these, these dishes, which even have evidence as far back as Pliny the Elder, the, the Roman naturalist who talked about them, they actually appear, as far as we can tell, to have spread in from Asia at some point a few thousand years ago. So, of course, these have been now in Italy for a very long time. Um, much longer than some of the other ingredients which we'll cover soon but it's interesting to think that even even ingredients like these which have been you know in uh, Italy as long as the Romans is not actually native to Italy it's very interesting so there we go there's the garlic all diced up look at that uh, I'm actually quite proud of that one but uh, let's the less said about this onion chopping the better but uh, still like I said, we're going to take that onion, now we're going to chop it in half, and we're going to get rid of half of it, but, but uh, well, not get rid, you can use that in another dish, of course, but we're going to dice this one, now we're going to peel it, uh, off camera of course, and then we're going to dice this up into tiny little pieces. And yeah, I mean, it's so interesting to me that both of these obviously came from, from elsewhere, and are now so important in Italian cooking, so we're going to try and chop across this, but... Uh, yeah, like I say, I made an absolute hash of this. And this bit's all going fine, and then it's all going to explode. Oh, not quite. Next chop now. Yep, there you go. Oh, dear. <laughs> I'm going to let this play out um, and just wait until I'm proud of what the onions become. And there we go, so I am much more proud of that than I was of it before, so that's a nice improvement. So, let's get into it. We will add a lot of olive oil, um, just kind of eyeball it, but more than you think. Um, you'll need lots of olive oil into a pan. I'm going to gonna heat that on a medium heat until it gets a bit of a shimmer and it's flowing around the pan. And now let's get our garlic into there. That's going to be the first of our aromatics. So what we want to do is we just want to kind of stir that around into the oil and then just maybe give that a minute or two just until it, well, until that's getting some incredible smells on there but obviously um, make sure it doesn't burn. And then we're also going to add some oregano and some chilli flakes. Now 
This, um, these were additions that were suggested in the more modern Italian-American recipe and it cited um, their inclusion as part of the Italian-American diaspora and about how it was an addition in Italian um, pizza restaurants in New York. Apparently that was a, uh, a difference that was made, which you won't find in the earlier recipes, but the inclusion of the chili flakes and the oregano this early on definitely adds a fantastic smell. I mean, obviously, uh, it, whether or not it improves the dish overall, I, th I think it does, but it's indisputable. This, this smell that you get here, it really does get you in the mood for the rest of it. So. We've let the rest of it get aromatic, but now we're going to add the chopped onion, and this is going to add some um, nice sugar into the into the dish. The sweet, you know, the, the sugars of the onion are really going to add a bit of sweetness later down the line. But what this is also going to do is the onion is going to sweat as we heat it up, which is going to add a bit of moisture and prevent the garlic, especially, but also our other ar aromatics from burning. So we're just going to give that a nice move around and cook that for a good while. And now, look at that, look at all that colour, that is sizzling absolutely beautifully. And we're keeping it on the medium heat, we don't want it to burn, so we're maybe giving it a bit longer than you might do if you had a, a high heat for this onion, but just to sort of treat the aromatics with a bit of respect. And now we're going to add a bit of tomato paste. So we're going to put that into the pan and give it a good stir until it's combined, and that's going to really give us a, a much richer sauce than if we just use normal tomatoes. now. Tomato paste is actually of Italian origin. Um, they essentially in southern Italy they will put it onto wooden boards and dry it uh, until it becomes a much more condensed paste. So that is actually Italian in origin. So now we've got the puree nice and combined, we're going to add some tin tomato. So we've got some fine chopped tomato um, and we're also going to add some peeled whole tomatoes as well. And that's going to add a nice bit of variety to our sauce um, and a bit of varying thickness. Now we will need to crush these tomatoes. First I'm going to try it with a spoon but uh, everyone always claims that uh, their nonna used to crush them with their hands. So. Uh, I'm just going to demonstrate to you uh, now why I think that's, no offence, quite stupid. So I'm going to take one now and squeeze, 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 and no, that's that's kind of gone everywhere. And now I've just have a mushy bit of tomato. Great, but yeah, we're, we've broken down the tomatoes, and now we are just going to stir that into a nice smooth sauce. And it's already looking quite good, but. Uh, First, let's add a, a bit more flavour to the mix. So we're going to add a bit of basil, just about a sprig and a half. I'm going to mix that in, and I can tell you now that already was smelling absolutely amazing. But we're going to just stir that in, make sure it's you know got well acquainted, and then we're going to cover it up, and then leave that for a little bit of time, a few hours at least. So we're going to come away from that now and we're just going to give that a bit of time to cook and have a quick history lesson. So tomatoes themselves uh, haven't really been available in European cuisines for m the majority of the last 2000 years. I mean, they only really uh, came around following the Columbian Exchange in the 1490s. But it may be surprising to hear for some of you that uh, it really didn't take on in Italian cuisine for quite a while. From what I've been able to find, uh, Francesco Leonardi appears to be the founder of a tomato sauce in Italy, and even then he was taking inspiration from French cuisine. Um, in his cookbook Lapicio Moderno, he made suggestions to add the sauce to pasta, and that seems to be the earliest place where um, this dish originates, at least in a written form. Uh, but the dish was then, in the following decades, greatly popularised by Luigi Bicchiere in the 1840s during the Risorgimento and I think that's very crucial because Bicchieri saw the combination of regional dishes as a means to cul uh, cultivate a broader sense of Italian nationalism bringing people of many contemporary Italian states together with their shared love of food and instead of fresh tomatoes I'm using tinned as you have already seen and that is with good reason Besides a lack of confidence in my ability, I also think it's really important to understand both the evolution of this type of dish and its rapid spread in popularity abroad. 
canned food became widely available in industrialised Europe in the mid 19th century, and canning tomatoes became a convenient method of shipping tomatoes from Italy to the United Kingdom. But um, as Italians saw these canned tomatoes leaving for the UK, they actually decided they wanted some for themselves, and tin tomatoes became very popular in Italy. And the tin tomatoes ended up being extremely important in the following decades and centuries as Italian Americans new to the United States um, were wanting to make some of their own dishes from back home and tin tomatoes were far more widely available and as a result it became far more easy for um, Italian immigrants into the US, especially in places like New York, to actually continue their heritage cuisine which is why there is so much Italian American food today and that is why I've used an Italian American recipe today to sort of bridge the two as we can see this food in a global world doesn't just change with the location of the ingredients but also the location of people cooking it and so for the pasta I'm using orecchiette a Puglian pasta shape named for its resemblance to an ear I've chosen this partly due to its unusual shape and due to its frequent appearance in Francesco Leonardi's work felt very apt to pay tribute to the godfather of modern Italian food. So bringing water to a boil and cooking the pasta in very salty water as you can see. Um, in this case we'll keep some authenticity and cook it for around 12 minutes to ensure it remains al dente. And pasta was popular for a long time in Napoli because of the fact it could have been stored dry and for prolonged periods of time it made it immensely popular with sailors and merchants, much like the tin tomatoes before. Um, and its versatility and variety soon meant it was popular across Italy, spreading through even more outlets across the world over the next century, following the Risorgimento. And now let's look at how the sauce is doing, and wow, that has thickened up absolutely beautifully. I think you can absolutely um, cook this sauce on a higher heat for less time, maybe 90 minutes, but slow and steady definitely wins the race for good flavour all of the basil and onion and garlic is really deepening the flavor here so I cooked that for about three hours uh, you could cook it for longer just make sure to keep stirring it but I think I think this has gone perfectly at three hours and now we're just picking out all of the different pieces of basil all of the spent sprigs if you can't find all of them that's completely fine just see what you can find and take out the ones um, that, you, that are very noticeable. I don't think anyone's going to complain though, especially not with the flavour that you will get at the end of this dish. And now the basil's gone, we are going to add some fresh ground black pepper and we're also going to add a little bit of salt as well. I think maybe you could have added a bit less than I did just there. Um, the pasta is going to be doing a lot of the heavy lifting on the saltiness, especially with that pasta water that, that it was boiling in. And now we're going to add some butter as well. This was um, very unorthodox in a lot of Italian cuisine for a long time, but it certainly has its origins in French cuisine and has certainly become a staple now in Italian-American cuisine, is adding a little bit of fat like butter into the sauce. And as you can see, that's made it so much more smooth and creamy than it was before. I think it's a really good choice both for flavor, but also for texture in the sauce. Oh wow, so now we're gonna get all of that pasta going in there. And as I found out, uh, this pasta is extremely difficult to stir the sauce into, so we're going to cut ahead slightly, I think, because this may take just a little while. And there we go. That's all been added in now, and that is looking absolutely beautiful. Look at how excited I am. That's, yeah, completely understandable. And we're going to add a bit of parmesan as well, just for a little bit more Italian authenticity. It's not my go-to cheese, but I think both Italians and Italian-Americans would be very upset if I didn't use a bit of that. And we'll also remove the bit that I just dropped in there by accident. And I think this dish is, you know, it looks amazing, and I think we've added quite a lot of different elements there. A bit of the old, a bit of the new. Let's have a look to where it's all come from, let's see how it tastes. Oh yeah. <laughs> Absolutely table slappingly delicious. I would strongly recommend trying this, maybe adding your own variation, maybe tapping into the older elements or the newer elements. I'm very happy. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it. It's certainly been an illuminating experience looking into how 
even the most quintessentially national dish can have inspirations all over the world. Be sure to check out the different citations I've used throughout this video and have a lovely day.